Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael Aun Beor. Gnosis is the root wisdom of the world's greatest knowledge. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of hundreds available as free downloads, podcasts, or transcriptions. Our lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures to find teachings that suit you. Twice a month, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live and includes a free online classroom allowing listeners to see images, read related scriptures, and ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate, visit GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is a service of Glorianne Publishing, a non-profit organization. The lectures and radio broadcast have been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. To make a donation, visit GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Let us study the mysterious Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton is a Greek word that addresses the four Hebrew letters Yod, He, Vav, He, which spell the name of the divinity according to Kabbalah. The Holy Bible, the Torah, and the Tanakh are books written based on the Zohar or the Kabbalah. Ignosis, we always state that the doctrine that Moses gave to humanity was given in three ways. The Zohar which is the spirit of the doctrine, the Talmud, which is the soul of the doctrine, and the Bible, which is the body of the doctrine. So the Bible itself and all the stories and the descriptions that we find in it are based on the spirit and the soul of the doctrine. In the Bible, we find many stories related with the life of many prophets. In esotericism, we name those prophets eons or masters of the day who reach the realization of their being. They achieve complete realization. So we call them eons or yoms, which means days in Hebrew, vehicles of the light. Light is the first expression or manifestation of the unknowable. In Kabbalah, the unknowable, the unknowable has three aspects, namely Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sof Aur. These are the three aspects of the unknowable that is represented by the last letter He of yod hey vav hey the tetragrammaton 
within the unknowable, we find that which we call a Elohim or Ain Elohim, which is the unknowable city. A Elohim is that city which cannot in any way be represented because it is unknowable, light. Aur in Kabbalah. Thus, light, Aur, abides in it and emanates from it. Let us now study the light within the meaning of uh, and Elohim said, which hides the mystery of me, El, and Elohim. And Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. The Hebrew letters of the phrase, Vei Amar, and said, can be disarranged as follows. Mi Aur, which in Hebrew means, who? Light. Let us read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26, in order to understand. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who has created these things? The word who is me, and this is Ele. Together, they form the word Elohim. At the end of the word Elohim, the syllable I am, im, is me backwards. That means who? This is the concealed and hidden one, the Holy Spirit. Is he whom all created things are seeking to know. But after all their efforts and endeavors by the gaining of knowledge, that or gnosis, they only come at last to the Divine Mother Devi Kundalini. Ma, meaning what? That is a quotation from the Zohar. Thus, and Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light, can be read or read in the following way. Who? The light of Elayam, the cigars, the insof, will be light, and light will be. In other words, quoting now Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when we read, And Elohim said unto Moses, I become who I am. In Hebrew, Eheye Asher Eheye. I become who I am. <coughs> Eheye is a tetragrammaton or four lettered word that represents Keter. The father of all lights, the infinite. Through the tetragrammaton, 
the light a share becomes the tetragrammaton. Both words, me and a share, mean who in Hebrew. This is why ma, that means what in Hebrew, that are written with the letters mem and he of Elohim, called the light day. It's quoted in Genesis first, verse five, and Elayam called Aur, the light, Yom, day. <coughs> Observe that the Hebrew word Yom contains the letters of the word Mi, who, divided by the letter Vav, that represents the spinal medulla, the Kundalini. The Book of Sohar states, the premial celestial light, Mi Aur, of the first day is Mi or Asher, Bina, the Holy Spirit, which lightened the other days of creation. This is why the word Yom, daylight, is repeated in each day of Genesis. Master Samael on the Or states, in the name of truth, we solemnly affirm the following, the third Logos, the Holy Spirit, Shiva, Bina, is the first begotten of creation, our inner individual monad, or more correctly, our supreme Super individual monad. Me or the light, the husband of Ma, the cigares, El Ayam, Devi Kundalini, our particular cosmic mother. By Reading the following verse of this book of Genesis, we read, <coughs> And Elohim saw at the Logos in the light our of He, the ends of, that it was good. Thus, me, Aur, that means who, light in Hebrew, or Asher, is the first manifestation of He, the ends of the city, which is precisely the origin of At, Aleph Tav, the Logos. We understand this by reading the first very chapter and verse of the book of Genesis. Berashit bera Elohim at ha shamaim veat haaretz. This means six created bar a Elohim the son of Elohim, at Aleftav, the word in the heavens, and at the word in the earth. Observe that the Hebrew word at Aleftav is before Hashamaim, 
the heavens, and before Haaretz, the earth. Thus, At Aleph Tav symbolizes the word, the Logos, the son of Elohim. So At Aleph Tav is the head of the heavens and the head of the earth. Now, the Hebrew words Elohim at Hashamaim veat Haaretz contain the four letters Yod Hei Vav Hei de Tetragrammaton sequentially. About uh, at Aleph Tav, the word the Logos the son of Elohim, it is stated in the book of Revelation. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, a sharp to each sword, and his countenance was as Ha Aur, the light. Of the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, meaning at a left of the Logos, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am Aleph. The first, and Tav, the last. Revelation 1, 14, 17. And our light is the way in which all of us can acquire understanding, comprehension of our own origin. This is why we come and gather here in order to know about ourselves. Each one of us is nothing but a particle of that unknowable entity. When we address this unknowable city, we cannot state that it is a God because, because it is beyond gods. It is the origin of gods. <coughs> men and everything in the universe. That is why we said unknowable. And if we describe it and said it is like this or like that, then it will become knowable. Obviously, it is unknowable within the consciousness of each one of us. Thus, what we want is that CET to become noble in each one of us. Knowing is precisely the work that we have to perform. To know is the effort that we had to do in order to acquire knowledge <coughs> about that which we are. Thus, uh, we have to work on it with E-A-O. The three primary forces, which are represented, <coughs> excuse me, in the first letters of the holy name of God, Yod Hei Vav. This is why the light of the ends of or transform into three primary forces, namely Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
כתר חוכמה בינה. which give us access to it. And this is why in Kabbalah, when we talk about the manifested force or manifested light, we always point at the first triangle of the tree of life. This Trimurti or Trinity is nothing but three aspects of the same light But for the universe, that light is unknowable. However, these three aspects are knowable. Or we will say, it can become knowable in our consciousness. Thus, in order to know at, meaning Aleph Tav, Our origin, the unknowable, which in Kabbalah is called the Ein Sof, <coughs> we do it through its three logoic aspects. This is why in Gnostic lectures, all the masters of the great work, Kabbalists and alchemists, always address the Trinity or those three lights the three model letters in different ways. This in order to emphasize that if we want to perform at, which again is a synthesis of the logos, the first Aleph and the last letter Tav of the Hebrew alphabet, at, we have to do it in the triune way. The three brains by united or by uniting heaven and earth. To become a disciple, to become a neophyte of EAO, the three primary forces, is precisely what our own particular individual spirits want. You see, now we are addressing here Chesed, our own individual spirit. We have uh, El Chesed inside, our own particular spirit our own particular angel, which we can call our inner God or our inner most. The inner most or inner God, the spirit, is the higher part of ourselves. He is El. An emanation of these three manifested lights, which came from that own noble light. At Haor is an eon or a yom, an innermost. We can also say At Haor is an El, a master of the day, that achieved the union with the light of Iao, the three primary forces. And therefore, he becomes, at the dawn of creation, a representation of At, or those 22 elements, letters, or archetypes of the Logos, the Word, that we had to develop. We had to develop those archetypes in order to acquire at ha aur. Remember, when we said at, we are addressing the 22 letters of the Word, 
of God, 22 letters which the Bible used in order to write. And the word ha, our, is of course addressing the light or the unknowable that appears in the universe. This is how the Bible called the union of the Logos with the light of the ends of at haur. In Hebrew, there is an ion or master, a prophet, whose name is Eliao. He is called Elijah in English. And when he had a physical body, he came to manifest this type of knowledge in order to show with his own life the work that our El, innermost, has to perform with Yao. Thus, Eliao is a very significant name in Kabbalah. The rabbis or masters Kabbalists of the Zohar state that among the great prophets of the past, we find Moses and Eliyahu, or Elijah. And Elijah, or Eliyahu, this is how his name is pronounced according to Judaism, is one of the highest. So Elijah, or Eliyahu, is actually a name whose Kabbalistic correlation regarding pronunciation and spelling, <coughs> we should know. We are referring to the phrase that was pronounced by the Master Jesus on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama savaktani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calls for Elijah. Matthew 28, verses 46 and 47. In Hebrew, Eli means my God. Yet we know that Eli, Eli, Lama Savaktani is a Mayan phrase. Yet they mistook that phrase with a Hebrew phrase. Because in Hebrew, Eli means my God. Now, we find that Jah of Elijah or Yao of Eliao in Hebrew is also a very profound Kabbalistic word. Keter, which is the first sephira of those three lights, has Ja as a, as a mantra. Thus, Ja is a mantra in order for us to communicate with Keter. Ja is a word that vibrates with Keter. Ja, as well as Yao, are at the end of Hallelujah. A very common word. That is always sung by great singers in many operas and compositions. Hallelujah means praise. Thus, when we say hallelujah, we are praising or addressing the duality father mother. Because ja is written with yod and he, and yod represents the father and he the mother, as well as yod he vav, i a o, 
addresses the Trinity, or first three emanations of the light of the Ein Sof. These three are Keter, Chokmah, and Binah. <coughs> Keter is called the Ancient of Days. He is also called the goodness of goodness, the mercy of mercies. He is the highest part of our own particular individuality because each one of us has his own particular Keter. Keter acquires different levels in accordance with the efforts that we as souls perform here. We will say in this way that Keter needs to be remembered by us, here and now. This is done in order for him to perform something here, in order for us to know ourselves. That is to say, in order to have knowledge about our true self. Thus, we need to remember Ja, Keter, <coughs> who is an androgynous force. Nonetheless, he is uh, called the Ancient of Days, the father of all fatherhood. Remember, his mantra is Ja. So when you said the name Elijah, you said, My God is Ja. In English, we find the three letters in Ja, which addresses the three forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This also applies when you write the name Eliao in Hebrew. If you are familiar with the Hebrew letters, you find Yao at the end of the name Eli. Ao, Elijao. First, we find uh, Aleph and Lamed, which uh, spells El, which means God in Hebrew. Then, Yod, He, Vav, which spells Iao, because in Hebrew, Elijah is pronounced Eliao. This is how we write in Hebrew his name. This is how it is pronounced. In esotericism, in Gnosis, the holy name of God is Yao. Or we will say the holy name of El is Yao. The word El means God. El is a particular individual God within us. That El is Hesed, our own spirit, that emanates from Elohim, that represents the Trinity, Keter, Chokmah, Bina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I-A-O, those three aspects that emerge from that light which is unknowable. This is why in Gnosticism we state the following. If we take into account the light of the ends of or, which is unknowable, and represented by the letter hey, and we add it to the three primary forces of Elohim, represented by Yao in the Hebrew letters Yod Hey Vav, then we have four letters. Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. This is the unknowable plus the three noble. Thus, they form the famous Tetragrammaton, the four letters of Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. That represents the holy name of God. That is why we say that each one of us has his own particular Jehovah or Yod, Chava or yod he vav he, their own particular tetragrammaton. 
Thus, obviously, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey is what represents God. And for us, in order to work, in order to perform what we had to do, we had to do it through the tetragrammaton. Because Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey is God, who is the only one that can create. Yet, such creation has to be done through us, and this is something that is very important to understand. Nevertheless, this is not a belief, or as some people think, a subject matter that we have to believe in order to, in order not to believe in it, but something that we had to perform. All the elements that we need in order to perform the great work are within, not without. They are within. And this is why Gnosis as a doctrine exists. Kabbalah is the science through which the masters, the eons, come and tell us, little by little, in which way we have to do it, because this is the way they did it. Therefore, we work with these different eons in order to perform the realizations of the different parts of our being. When our own particular monad descends into the matter, and in the effort of acquiring knowledge of itself, it unfolds or becomes divided into different parts, or we will say as Episthesophia states, and that mystery knoweth wherefore the great light of lights hath rent itself asunder, and wherefore it hath come forth from the fatherless. Thus, the realization of the self is to gather or to collect all the parts in one, in order for it to return to its own origin. Such is the great work, and that is when those light particles that express as three and as many in the universe become one. You see, <coughs> the same word universe explain it in itself. The meaning of it is in the very word. Uni is from unus, meaning one, and verse is the versus, past participle of vertere, meaning to turn into the adverse, the contrary of the one. So the universe is the contrary of the unity which rent asunder into many, unity into plurality. This is why we state that plurality or diversity is unity. Thus, unity becomes diversity, many. So we have to Kabbalistically see God individually as Elohim and not as many people mistakenly see it. Namely, that there is one God up there and, uh, and there are many other gods down here and that we as individuals, are those many gods. No. There is not one God up there, which is uh, outside. 
The God that is up there, which is my God, is inside, and I am the lowest part of it. Thus, above me, there are other parts of that God that I need to gather in order to become one with all of the parts of my God. This is precisely what we call the serialization of the being, and which is represented in many books, not only in the Bible. Nonetheless, we always take the Bible as an uh, example because the Bible is written in code based on at. Remember, at means Aleph Tav, the whole alphabet, Kabbalistic alphabet. In other words, the word, the tree of life, the 22 arcana, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The Bible is a book that was created to do this in order to explain all the work that we have to do here. It was designed in this way from the past. Unfortunately, people have the Holy Bible, but they do not understand it. The plan was to bring different self-realized masters from the past <clears throat> in order to explain the work to the multitudes. So the book was delivered to, huma to humanity. However, no true master unveiled it to them. This is why many people find stories that just don't make any sense, that are con that contradictory to them because they do not understand its Kabbalistic language nor the alchemical symbols that are written therein. For instance, we find in the Bible, in Genesis, the first book written by Moses, that all of those lights are named the people of Israel. Moses is another Ian or Yom. Indeed, Moses exists. He is a self-realized master. Yet, as Eon, he represents in us an element, an archetype that we must awaken. Moses has to gather all of the archetypes that are named the people of Israel. Likewise, the people of Israel exist and existed in Moses' time. Yet, in the Bible, they symbolize the archetypes of Tifereth, which needs the light, knowledge, or that Gnosis, to be delivered unto them. Jesus of Nazareth is also another eon that represents another part of ourselves. Thus, when we read that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, we have to delve within ourselves in order to find that archetype that is the only Son of God. Because everyone has Jesus Christ Bereshit, bar, a Elohim, inside, in potentiality. When we study that, we know that when the Bible states that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, we understand that the Bible is not addressing someone outside of us, <coughs> but inside. Because we know that Jesus of Nazareth represented that master archetype that we need to develop. Yet people who call themselves Christians think that the physicality of Jesus is the only Son of God. They ignore that and the fact that he represents 
an archetype that we need to develop. Such is precisely the problem of this present Western humanity that read everything literally. Those they ignore that they ignore. For instance, when you study astrology in relation to the tree of life, you then know that the first Sephira Keter, the father, is related with the infinite. The infinite is formed by all of those galaxies that we observe in the sky with telescopes. In this day and age, we have discovered more than 100 million galaxies. And as we know, our particular galaxy is named the Milky Way. It is just one among those millions. Well, Keter represents the infinite. All of those galaxies. But if we take just one of those galaxies, in itself, we then find Hohoma, the sun, S-O-N. Hohoma is the second aspect of the, tri the trine light, of the trinity. Thus, Hohoma represents the zodiac. The zodiacal belt, or better said, the light of all the stars of our galaxy is channeled into our solar system and the planet Earth through a belt of constellations, which we call the zodiacal belt. <coughs> the zodiacal belt is associated with 12 zodiacal signs or 12 constellations. Those 12 constellations are what the Bible call the 12 tribes of Israel. The Bible describes how those uh, tribes descended into Malkut, Egypt, Mizraim. It describes how Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, which is another Ian. You see, Jacob is another master, which represents Tifereth, the Sephirah, that in relation with the 12 tribes represents the highest human part in us. Yet, Jacob existed. He is and was the Bodhisattva of the angel Israel. So, this angel Israel represents precisely the human soul, which we are talking about here. Israel is an Ian that represents all of the parts that we have to gather. The people of Israel are all of those parts. This is why in Gnosticism we explain the word Israel. Actually, in Hebrew, you write Israel like this. Yod, Shin, Resh, Aleph, Lamed. The letter Shin sounds like Sh or S. The word Israel ends with L, which means God. Therefore, we have Israel. If we add the letter Aleph to the first syllable of the word Israel, we, we then have the word Ish. This spells Mel in Hebrew. Ish. Mel, in Hebrew, is Mel fire, is associated with is, which is a syllable 
that contains four wicks or four jods, the three jods of the letter Shin and the jod in itself, forming the tetragrammaton or four jods or four letters. That is the fire that develops or creates, that procreates the different parts of Ra. Is in Egypt is called Isis, the female aspect of the old man, the tetragrammaton. The letter Resh of Israel spell Resh Yod Shin. Literally, this means head in Aramaic. By itself, the letter Resh sounds Ra. And that's why we said is Ra'el. And this Ra is related to El, the intelligent aspect of the fire. You know that Ra is the sun. Ra does not address the physical sun, but Christ, the solar light, the solar absolute, or Ain of Or which, as we are explaining here, is the first emanation of the unknowable, the eternal cosmic common father, the unknowable's son. Ra expresses itself as light everywhere in the universe. Ra, the solar light, travels in the space. Ra is called in this day and age the quanta phenomena. Quanta are packages of solar energy that travel in circles and at the speed of light in the space. The quanta move at different speeds within different elements. Quanta is what we see, the light that we see and we say, this is a horse, this is a tree, this is a star, this is a planet. Quanta is precisely that solar radiation that moves at different speeds. When the quanta move faster than the capacity of our physical sight, we do not see them. Likewise, when quanta move too slow, we do not see them. We are antennas that only capture the quanta that vibrates to a frequency that our physical sight can receive. Thus, quanta moves at other types or velocities in other dimensions. Therefore, in order to capture the different frequencies of the solar light, we have to develop other senses. That is why we always insist that we have to develop the seven chakras or the seven other senses in order to capture the other frequencies of the solar light. <coughs> so Ra rent itself, rent in itself asunder into those packages of solar energy that we call the 12 tribes of Israel. Thus each tribe or solar package has, as you know, a resh, or resh, or head, 12 sons, 12 heads, but each one has many children, or sparks of light. 
So when we study the 12 tribes of Israel, we find thousands of igneous particles that is sprouted from their own origin, which is Chesed, El, our own being. They descended from Chokhmah, the zodiacal belt, through the different sephiroths, and finally entered into Malkut, which is Egypt, or Mizrahim, which is how the Bible names Malkut. Malkut is at the very bottom of the tree of life. And it is always represented by the planet Earth, the physical world, the world of matter in action. Below Malkut, we find the shadow of the tree of life, the night spheres that we find above Malkut project nine sphere shadows below it. They are depicted below the sphere of Malkut, but in reality they are within Malkut. If you read the Divine Comedy, of Dante Alighieri, you will discover how Dante describes those nine spheres. Dante enters into the infinite dimensions of nature within the inner layers of the earth. The infinite dimensions are not physical because if we go physically, we will just find rocks, metals, magma, etc. But we are talking about infra dimensions, which are be below the three dimensional world in which we live. And this is something that we have to understand because within those infra layers, we also find supra dimensions. The Master Samae on the or explain this as follows. <clears throat> it is good for all of you to understand that this planetary organism of which we live has three clearly defined aspects in its, in its interior. First, the merely physical mineral region. Second, the supra-dimensional sun. Third, the infradimensional sun. It is urgent for you to comprehend in an integral manner that everything in nature and in the cosmos is reduced to additions and subtractions of dimensions that mutually penetrate and co-penetrate each other without disorder. There exists an arithmetic postulate that states that which is above is as that which is below. Apply this postulate to this subject matter under discussion. Clearly, According with the law of correspondences and analogies, the nine heavens have their correspondences with the interior of our planetary organism. These nine heavens with the, in, with the interior of the planetary organism in which we live are intelligently correlated with the nine profound zones of the planet Earth. However, allow me to explain this subject matter in depth. What really happens is that these night heavens have a gravitational atomic center that is exactly located in the center of the planet Earth. In other words, I want to tell you, 
ladies and gentlemen, that the nine heavens that gravitate around such a gravitational atomic center of the planet Earth are extended far beyond the whole solar system. This same process is repeated in each of the planets of the solar systems or our solar system of ours. Samael on the Earth. <clears throat> Thus, in the center of the planet Earth, there is a temple of light in which we find the genie of the, or the eon, who is the force, the life of this planet. A great being that the Bible calls Melchizedek, the king of the earth. That temple of light exists within the supra dimensions, but within the earth, within its center. Because if we go into the infra dimensions, we find hell. And Dante states that we find in the ninth sphere of hell, Lucifer. Anyhow, according to Kabbalah, Malkut means kingdom. What do we need in order to have a kingdom? A king and a queen. Because a kingdom without a king and a queen is not a kingdom. Melech and Malka is king and queen in Hebrew. A kingdom also has great uh, beings that help the king to control the kingdom. They are called Adonai, which means Lord in Hebrew. As an example, we find that in England, you find the lords in relation with the kingdom of England. Lords which have different lands or different powers in that kingdom. Now, the main point is that in Malkut, in the planet Earth, in this physical world, which precisely correlates to our, our physicality, we have a kingdom. But uh, it is divided. Behold, we find atomically gravitating around the center of the planet Earth, Malkut, nine spheres above and nine spheres below. Thus, the physical earth, Malkut, is in the middle of heaven and hell. <coughs> so, how do we call the kingdom of the earth as a cosmos? We call it Mesocosmos, which means the cosmos in the middle. That is why the earth itself or any planet is called Mesocosmos. Because it is in the middle of two cosmoses. From it, we can go up or down. Below is a tritocosmos, clipoth, hell. And above, the other cosmoses, represented by the four Kabbalistic worlds of the tree of life. We are called the microcosmos. But as microcosmos, we are still in development. Because physically speaking, we have all the elements of the microcosmos, but in potentiality, not in activity. In order to become a real microcosmos, we had to develop all of the megalocosmos within. Thus, we can become indeed a microcosmos, which is a human being in the complete, complete sense of the word. A microcosmos is somebody that has cognizance of what is below and above. 
Then we always find that uh, there exist in the kingdom, Malkut, two microcosmic elements that can control the forces of nature. Those two microcosmic elements in the Hebrew language are similarly named. For instance, what in English is Sir or Mr. is Baal in Hebrew. Yet, Lord, which means that the Targamaton is Adonai. So Adonai, Lord, represents in Malkut the forces above. And Baal, the forces below. And this is something that is not often apprehended by the Kabbalists. For instance, in the Bible, Elijah addresses these two opposites. He addresses the demons, the Baalim the inferior being that he has to destroy. Baalim is a plural for Baal. Baal or Baal is singular, and Baalim is plural. In the book of Kings, verse 18, 21st and 22nd verse is written, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the tetragrammaton is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, Remain a prophet of the Tetragrammaton. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. So the Baalim are the individuals, the entities that are related to the lower kingdoms, the infra dimensions, hell, Klippot, while Adonai is related with the forces above, with the heavens. And that is why you find, when you read the book of Kings, which is the book of the Tetragrammatons, because every king is a Tetragrammaton, that refers to those initiates that achieved Da'at, or the level of yod Chava, Tifereth initiation. Thus we always find their opposite. The representation of that battle between above and below is represented in many religions. Not only in those found in the Bible. We see, for example, in the book of Exodus, written by Moses, who is obvious an eon because he is above. He is on the Mount of Sinai in front of yod the Tetragrammaton. And yod Chava Chochmah sent him down to Egypt. It is written. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mightest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. Those people of Israel are his own particles, parts of himself, parts of light that need to be gathered in order to return to the highest part. Unfortunately, those parts are bottled up, trapped within the protoplasmic matter. And this is what in Genesis and Exodus Moses calls the Pharaoh. 
Elijah called them Baal, the Baalim. The Baalim could be good people or bad people. As you know, in this physical world, there is a lot of people that ignore these matters. They are good people who are trying to do their best. But their soul is still scattered abroad into many parts and to many eagles. They do not possess their own souls within themselves. They do not know how. <coughs> Jesus, in the Gospel of John, talking about uh, these matters to the Rabbi Nicodemus, he said, and no man had ascended up to heaven, but he, Tifereth, that came down from heaven. Even Moses, the son of man, which is in heaven. That's why he added after that. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever has faith in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Behold how Jesus points out that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man, Tifereth, the human soul, must lift up all of its parts. As Jesus said, in patience, you will possess your souls. The serpent in the wilderness is Isis, the serpent force, which is always a feminine force. Nahash is calling Hebrew. Obviously, Moses knew about Nahash. That is why he performs miracles with Nahash. That Nahash, Nahash, or serpent, is, as you know, the kundalini, or sexual force, that rises in the spinal column that is represented in the staff that Moses carries. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, we read, and Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, not hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The tetragrammaton had not appeared unto thee. And the tetragrammaton said unto him, What is that in thy hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. And the rod became a serpent. And Moses fled from before the serpent. And the tetragrammaton said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take the serpent by the tail. And Moses put forth his hand and cut it. And the serpent became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Tetragrammaton, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of God, uh, the God of Jacob, had appeared unto thee. Thus, with the Son of Man, or the staff, the serpent that Moses lifted up, he transformed the waters of the river Nile into blood and makes different miracles in front of the Pharaoh. <coughs> Nevertheless, when Moses is in front of the Pharaoh, the Baalim, or the sorcerers of Egypt, do nearly the same miracles. Let us read. 
Exodus chapter 7. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. This means that the Son of Man swallows the powers of the Baalim, or magicians of Egypt, when performing the psychological work. So there we find two types of priesthoods, above and below. These two types of priesthoods teach the same thing and are based on the same force. And this is why the Master Samael Omer said, It is unquestionable that the horrible python serpent is a negative and fatal opposite. Better said, the shadow, the radical antithesis of the serpent of light, since indubitably truth disguises itself with darkness within the abyss, within the shade in the shadow of Klippoth. Thus, to see miracles is not a big deal. Nature performs great miracles. The whole of creation is a miracle. It is written that the snake has the power to create gods, worlds, planets, suns, stars, demons, human beings, beasts, plants, and everything. Nevertheless, what Jod Chabag wants is to do all of that consciously. And the only one that can help us in the beginning is Eliyahu, Elijah. Thus, we have to concentrate our minds and to always remember Jah. Actually, Hallelujah is a mantra that brings the forces of Jah into us. When we say Hallelujah, we receive the strength of Jah. Anybody can receive the strength. Yet, it is a mistake to think that because we gather in a group and we sing hallelujah, then we form a spiritual group and that Jah descends and this is done. No. Everybody has to evoke his own Jah. Even if you are alone in the desert saying hallelujah, you are evoking only one Jah, your own particular individual Jah. Here, when we sing hallelujah, everyone will sing his own hallelujah and bring, therefore, his own jah. And obviously, those jahs will bring a gigantic force, jah, because each of us is a channel in different levels. Other mantras exist that can bring the forces of Keter. But this particular uh, master, Elijah, is characterized by his own zealous. He is always zealous of Jehovah. Elijah or Eliao means Jehovah is my God. This means that our own inner Elijah is the one that always Concentrate, remembers his own God. And this is why we always insist in Gnosticism, the first step in order to acquire self-realization is to recognize that God has to do it through ourselves. And therefore, we have to bring God into our consciousness. 
by remembering God. Jah is the word. Hallelujah. Yet, Jah has no form, but takes any form that he wishes. So, the remembrance of the self, to remember the self from moment after moment, is what is important. Because the Trinity acts through Jah, the head of the three primary forces, is Jah. It is Keter. Therefore, Elijah means to always remember Jah. To be always attentive. To be here and now. Because that is precisely to remember God. To be here and now. It is not by putting in our minds some image. Remember, it is stated that one of the first commandments that Jah gave to Moses was and is, Thou shalt not make any image, because the images are from the mind, but Jah has no form. It is, we can say, coexistential with the moment, with the present. And the only part of ourselves that can be in the present is the consciousness. Thus, the consciousness is part of Jah. If you remember, Jah, it is because you are here and now. You are connected to Jah. Indeed, in the beginning, you do not capture the full essence or the 100% of Jah. Because your inner Israel is in bondage. It is in slavery to the ego. Your ego. Thus it is difficult. The fear scatters us away. But Moses persists. Because he is willpower. Let my people go. This is what we have to do. We have to use telema in ourselves in order to control our mind, the intellect, which is, in this case, the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh sometimes makes us doubt. To doubt is normal in us because we are individuals that have intellect. And the intellect took us out of our inner senses we do not see beyond the three-dimensional world and therefore without. Telema, Moses, does the effort in us. But the Pharaoh, the mind, says, Who is the tetragrammaton that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Tetragrammaton, neither will I let Israel go. So this is an internal battle. It is what the Bhagavad Gita calls the Mahabharata, the great battle. And it is precisely the word that Muhammad speaks in the Quran when he states that we have to unleash against the unbelievers, our defects, our mind. We had to be merciless against the unbelievers. We had to make them to believe. Please understand, the unbelievers are inside of all of us. They are not outside. We do not have the to worry about our friends, relatives, etc. If they do their work, good. We help them. If they do not, we have to respect them because their work is inside, not outside. So 
So this is not a matter of believing or not believing. It's a matter of doing. To become zealous of the work, meaning to love the work by itself. And Elijah represents that. Yet he also represents fire. Moses and Elijah, they have to work together in us. Moses is that willpower that is being born from the waters. As we know, Moses was born from the waters. The waters represents the sexual force, the waters of sexuality. There are many people in this world that wants to perform the work, but they forget that Moses was born from the waters to the princes of Egypt. Yes, the princes of Egypt found Moses floating in the Nile. The river Nile, Moses, Moshe, is with power that emerges from Yesod and rises to Tifereth, completely developed. Nonetheless, when we start this work, we are very weak. Yet, with the transmutation of the sexual force, Moses grows, develops, becomes strong, and liberates the fire. That fire, little by little, becomes uh, Elijah, Eliao. And this is what we said. In order for that entity that has to prepare the way of the tetragrammaton, to come, you have to pronounce e -a -o. Telema, willpower, gives birth to the true man, which is represented by Elijah. Because Elijah precisely means, my God is Jah. He is a son of Jah. And it is stated that he prepares the way of the Tetragrammaton. And who is the Tetragrammaton? Chokhmah is the Tetragrammaton. Such is the goal of any alchemist, of any Kabbalist, to bring the Tetragrammaton, Chokhmah, inside in order to finish the great work. But the Tetragrammaton cannot come inside if Elijah does not come first. To achieve that, we have to work with the three factors. Because Eliao or Elijah, Jah, represents the three primary forces of El. Thus we have to work with the three factors in order to work with the three primary forces. That is why we said the whole work is done with the three primary factors, to be born, to die, and to sacrifice for humanity. Charity is how we recognize the Messiah <coughs> when he comes. We recognize him when we are doing charity. Goodness is Elijah, who performs the good work, the great work of God. Let us read the Zohar to understand about this charity. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi while meditating near the tomb of uh, Rabbi Shimon bar Hohai, was visited by the prophet Elijah. When will the Messiah come? Asked Joshua. Ask him, replied the prophet. The Messiah is at the gates of Rome, which backward is Amore. He seated 
or sitting among the poor, the sick and the wretched. Like them, he changes the bindings of his wounds, but does so one wound at the time, in order to be ready at the moment's notice. Then Joshua went to Rome and met the Messiah and greeted him, saying, Peace upon thee, master and teacher. And the Messiah replied, Peace upon thee, O son of Levi. Joshua then asked, When will you be coming? And the Messiah said, Today. Joshua went back to Elijah and was asked what the Messiah said. Peace upon thee, O son of Levi, Joshua replied. And Elijah told him. That meant that he and his father will have a place in the world to come. Better say, in the world of becoming, that is called Olam Chaba, the world of Atiluth. Joshua then said that the Messiah had not told him the truth because he had promised to come today, but had not. Elijah explained, this is what he said to thee, Today, if you will hear his voice that says, And Elohim called the light day. A reference to the Psalm 95, verse 7. Making his coming conditional with the conditional not fulfilled. Remember that we are talking about the light and that the book of Genesis called the, the, the light day. If the Messiah said, I will come today, he means with the light. Matthew Samael on the earth stated about it. May peace reign, may peace reign in all hearts. Let us not forget that peace is light. Let us not forget that peace is an essence emanated from the absolute. It is light emanated from the absolute. This light is in Olam Chaba at Siluth, the light of the ancient of days. That's why Christ said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. In the Bible, in the book of Kings, we find how Elijah preaches about the work that we are teaching here. Elijah as an Ian, as a prophet, was a master that existed in the time of Atlantis. And this master was preaching this doctrine at that time, amongst other masters. Elijah reincarnated in John the Baptist. In the Gospel, in the New Testament, Jesus stated that John the Baptist was the reincarnation of Elijah. Jesus said, and from the days, Yom, remember that day means light, Yom, day. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. He that had ears to hear, let him hear. 
And Elijah came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sins is an alchemical psychological work because indeed John the Baptist was a master that existed at that time, who was really the incarnation of this eon, Elijah. He had a temple in the shores of the river Jordan. Everything that is written in the Bible about John the Baptist is Symbolic. Jesus went to Elijah, and Jesus represents the Messiah that we have to bring inside of us through John. But behold, John represents in each of us the seven vowels, because John represents the word. Thus we say, John is Johannes. Ioames, the seven vowels. Because in esoter esotericism, we find the M and the S are the sixth and the seven vowel vowels. So John is Johannes, Ioames, that represents the seven vowels, the seven parts of the true man. So if you become a true man, if you create within you the vehicle or, or vehicles that we have to create the internal bodies, you will become a John, a vehicle of the light, a vehicle of the sun, a vehicle of Helios, Elias, Elijah, or Eliao. So there are different levels of Elijah within each one of us and different levels or types of John or initiates. Now you are just reading this or hearing about this. <coughs> Yet, if you perform the work, if you achieve the self-realization of, of all the levels of the human being, which means if you create the astral body, the mental body, the causal body, you will become a John, a solar man, a vehicle, a vehicle of Elias, Elias, a true man, a true human being, a vehicle of Elijah. Yet, in order to become a vehicle of Elijah, to be at that level of human being, you have to be zealous. Meaning, you have to always remember your God and teach, preach about that, which is a particular alchemical work. This does not mean to believe in anything, but to work with it. You must inspire people to understand that the work is within, not without. Not to believe in anything, but to discover everything within, with effort, and give the clues to humanity. Every master is always, uh, always do that. So listen. It is written uh, in First Kings that I have the intellect who was the lawyer servant of this woman, a queen whose name uh, was Jezebel, the mind, was looking for Elijah, since everybody was confused and going in different directions and worshiping Baal, the forces, the mechanical forces of nature, of whom Jezebel is the queen. But Elijah was sending the people of Israel, the forces of the consciousness, which are trapped in Egypt, up into the tree of life, showing people the way. Thus, it is written. And it comes to pass when Ahab, the intellect, 
saw Elijah, that I have said unto him, Art thou he that uh, troubled Israel? And Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Tetragrammaton, and thou hast followed Baalim. About Jezebel, who represents the animal mind, the book of Revelation states, And unto the angel of the church of Theatira write, These things said the Son of God, who had his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, your mind, in other words, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto Baalim, idols of the mind. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children, with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the kidneys and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. That is Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 to 23. So Jezebel is precisely the mind. <clears throat> of this day and age, Jezebel is the protoplasmic mind that evolved from the mineral kingdom to the plant kingdom to the animal kingdom and now is queen in each one of us. Jezebel, it is the same whore that is upon a beast with seven heads in the book of Revelation. It is just a representation of the animal mind that each one of us has inside. The messenger of that animal mind is the intellect that every one of us has developed. Thus the intellect says, are you the one that troubles Israel? And Elijah says, I do not trouble Israel, but you and your father's house, because you abandoned Jah, the Tetragrammaton, or Joth Chava, and worship the Baalim. So those who worship the intellect are troubling Israel, which are those particles of light which represent their consciousness, their soul, because Israel represents all of those particles, those igneous particles of God trapped in their own protoplasmic mind. Elijah never troubled Israel, but liberate Israel, or helps to do it, while Jezebel, the mind and the intellect, traps them. Because in this day and age, Jezebel, the mind, is the queen of this world. And I have the intellect, is her servant. Jezebel has invented many things in this society. This society really is the outcome of the mind. The mind should serve the tetragrammaton, 
But Jezebel does not care about the Tetragrammaton. She called herself a prophetess. And indeed, there are many people uh, who, with their animal mind, serve as vehicles, channelers of the Baalim. They preach fornication. There are many just as in the time of Atlantis, when they were symbolically 450, which make the addition of nine. They are called in this day and age channelers, mediums, who channel clipotic forces. They were doing the same thing in Atlantis. But Elijah was channeling his own being. Jah, he never channeled any entity of Klipoth, because each of us has to serve as the vehicles and servants of his own tetragrammaton inside, and not to lend your body to the potencies of Klipoth, the protoplasmic forces which are liars, the Baalim. Thus, it is written there in a Kabbalistic and alchemical manner that Elijah said, How long shall ye between two opinions? If the Tetragrammaton be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I even I only remain a prophet of the Tetragrammaton. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Kabbalistic symbol that means fornication. Because make the addition of nine means that they are following fornication at this day and age. Or as Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon. It's written in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. You cannot serve Adonai and Baal or God and money and their many idols. So the book of Kings continues. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call you on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of the Tetragrammaton. And the God that answer with fire. Let him be God. And all the people answer and said. It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal. Choose you one bullock for yourselves. And dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dress it, and call on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us, but there was not voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it come to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god, either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he is sleeping. And must be awakened. And they cry aloud. And cut themselves. 
after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. And Elias said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the tetragrammaton that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the numbers of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the tetragrammaton come, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Tetragrammaton. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as wool contained two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood and he said do it the second time and they did it the second time and he said do it the third time and they did it the third time and the water ran ran about the altar and he filled the trench also with water thus being Elijah a vehicle of, of the light, he invokes the forces and commands the salamanders of the fire. Because any master that is an eon can command the four elements of nature. Thus Elijah invokes his own tetragrammaton, and the fire from heaven descends indeed. This is alchemy and Kabbalah. Because in those four barrels with water is the sacred tetragrammaton. And the water is a symbol of that which we call Shamajim, the fiery waters of heaven, or waters of sexuality. Let us continue reading. <coughs> and it came to pass, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Tetragrammaton, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant. And that I have done all of these things at thy word. Hear me, O Tetragrammaton. Hear me that these people may know that thou art the Tetragrammaton, God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Tetragrammaton fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And then when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Tetragrammaton, he is the God. The Tetragrammaton, he is the God. Phoenix of quotation. What these verses imply is that we have to go and to awaken the forces of the Tetragrammaton within. These forces are fire, air, water, and earth. And in order to sacrifice the bull, which is the beast in us, the fire has to come from heaven. Thus we have to know how to invoke that fire and how to develop it within. It is a great work, and this is how we work with the Tetragrammaton, which is a work of alchemy. 
Because those four letters represent the four elements of nature. When we study the four worlds or the four letters of God, we always associate that with the four corners of the world, the four elements, the famous four cherubim of Ezekiel. Did you hear about the Ark of the Covenant? In this day and age, because of that famous book, the Da Vinci Code, there is a lot of information on the internet in television about the secrets of the path. But still people do not understand the meaning of all of those things. Even though in the Da Vinci Code they talk a little bit about, they touch the Holy Grail and they say that the Holy Grail is really Mary Magdalene. Why? Because Mary Magdalene is a female that has the yoni. The yoni is a sexual female organ that represents the cup, the grail. And obviously, it is impossible to become a great male prophet, a great superman or eon without a holy grail. It is impossible. That is, that is why next to any male master, you find always the holy grail. And that Holy Grail is his spouse, simple, his wife. But that is the Holy Grail, because the Holy Grail represents the sexual feminine organ, simple. And the lance represents the phallus. When they depict Jesus as single and becoming a master, a real superman, walking on the waters and doing miracles, Without any woman to his side, in esotericism, this is a big lie. This is an adultery of the Gospels. Why did the ignoramuses take Jesus' wife out of the way? Obviously, Mary Magdalene has to be there. Likewise, any female master cannot become a powerful master without a man. It is coming into my mind now, for instance, uh, the great master Helen Petrova Blavatsky. She wrote The Secret Doctrine, a great esoteric monument. But uh, Colonel Olcott was to her side, giving her power, his masculine power, because she herself brought the Holy Grail, but she needed a lance, a spear. To work with a man, in other words. And it is always a representation of the two polarities. This is the whole secret hidden within the Ark of the Covenant, which is addressed very often here in the Holy Bible. There are many movies about it, such as the Indiana Jones movies in which he finds the Ark of the Covenant that uh, is throwing lightning and thunders. But that is a fantasy of the mind. Everyone has their own Ark of the Covenant. Do you see? The Ark of the Covenant has not only two cherubim on top, but also the four cherubim of Ezekiel, one in each corner, because four cherubim represent, <coughs> represents, or represent the four letters of the name of God, Yod, He, Vav, He, the Tetragrammaton. These four forces and those forces are always represented in the famous Sphinx, the parts of the lion, the legs of the bull, the wings of the eagle, and the face of the human being. Those are the four elements. The human being always represents the waters. The eagle, the air, the lion, the fire, and the bull, the earth. That is Sphinx, which is also represented in the Ark of the Covenant. But within the Ark of the Covenant, there were other elements, which symbolize, which represent 
the whole work that we had to perform. Within the ark was the staff of Aaron, the blooming staff, which represents the spinal column in the seven chakras, the seven flowers, or shushanas. It represents the spear and the sword as well. There was also the cap that we call the Holy Grail. The other two elements were the two tablets, stone tablets of the law. There were two because one is a man and the other is a woman. The covenant is the union of the two natures in both Adam and Eve, who are also addressed in the words, Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 23. These are the two natures of Adam. But these two natures, masculine and feminine, are always represented in each of us. Whether we are a woman or a man. Adam and Eve. The two sides of the tree of life. Physically united in Malkut. Uniting brain and heart. Through the at. Which is the mystery of Yesod sex. All of these make the Ten Commandments. Or Ten Androgynous Sephiroth. You see? And that is why we have two hands. Correct? One left and one right. One masculine and feminine, the other. Ten Commandments. When male and female are united, we then make the Ark of the Covenant because the staff of our own represents the phallus, the cup, the holy grail, represents the sexual yoni, the sexual feminine organ. And within the two stone tablets of the law are the rules. The four rings of gold are to be attached to the four feet. Two on each side. One is the man and the other is the woman. It is what you call yod hey vav hey, the tetragrammaton. When you unite all the elements in one, you have the sexual act between man and woman. And that is the holy name of God, the tetragrammaton, who creates. But this is only if we know how to manipulate the forces of God which are precisely in the sexual organs. It is written that the Holy Grail is called royal blood. This is the translation. Sangre, royal blood, as a translation of Holy Grail. And it is because the blood is a vehicle of the spirit or the fire. And the blood coagulates finally into that which we call the ovum. The ovum is that cap that receives the sperm in order for life to emerge. But of course, in this case, the real blood is the way in which we transform the ovum, the sperm, into energy. That is the royal force, the solar energy. The outcome of the transmutation. But only when we know the secrets of the Holy Grail. Because that is the Holy Grail. Unfortunately, uh, as this great magician of the 19th century, Eliphas Levy, states. Everyone is looking for the Holy Grail. And that Holy Grail is next to them. It is just next to them. Especially if they are merry. And this is precisely the secret, but uh, in order to start 
with this great work, with the Ark of the Covenant, we have to go down into Egypt. It is the kingdom where the king and the queen, according to alchemy, has to unite and to work with the forces of alchemy. This is what is hidden in different ways. But of course, for that we had to be zealous. We had to be an Elijah. And when I said zealous, I do not mean fanatic. Because that is the mind, Jezebel. It means to work consciously in ourselves and always respect others and God. But remember, this is to be zealous. To remember God second after second. Do not forget God. To love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And that is a great effort. That is to be zealous. <coughs> now, about the four letters of the Tetragrammaton and correlating them to the four seasons, you might uh, ask, how do the seasons relate with the four letters of the Tetragrammaton? Well, we can see it in this way. Yod is the fire of heaven that descends in spring. He is the earth that receives the fire within the fruits of summer. Vav is the air that ascends in autumn. The fire that ascends up to heaven again. And the last He is the water in heaven, Shamaim. Winter that retains that fire in heaven. Obviously, the letter He is always the representation of the Yoni, the sexual feminine force. And that obviously is always feminine. The force that retains, remember, He is a female that retains the forces. As the woman retains the fire in her womb. So when we say the holy name of God, it only has three letters. Yod, He, Vav. Because the four is a repetition of the second. So in this case, we will say that in relation with the elements, there are two elements above and two elements below. The elements below are the earth and the water. The earth and the water are always represented with hay. While the fire and the air with Yod and Bab. Those are the other two letters. Yod and Bab. Yod is fire and Bab is air. Or the staff upon which the fire rises. But let us continue explaining here about the two solstices and the equinoxes. We have two equinoxes and two solstices. Two of them relate with the solar fire of yod hay in spring and summer, while the other two, fall and winter, correspond with vav and hay. Listen. One is Yod and the other is Bab, which is precisely the fire and the air. These are elements that have a lot of fire, a lot of life, because fall is a descent of the force 
in winter. The fort is completely dead. That is related with the other letters. The other letter is hey. We have to apply that and to see how it applies. In the moment of the earth around the sun, or the movement of the earth around the sun, because those forces always act, as you said, in accordance with the equinoxes and solstices. For instance, the solstice of spring, or I mean of winter, is where the Tetragrammaton is born. And it is always represented by the Virgin, by Virgo, which always shines in the constellation of Virgo in December which is uh, in the north, and that is He, the womb of the mother. Of course, there is a moment when the initiate reaches a certain level in order for the Christ to descend into the womb of the woman, and that Christ is Yod. We will say that the four letters Yod, He, Vav, He, are related to the seasons, but every season with the four, because these are magical forces of the four letters, which are always present through the initiations. Remember, the tetragrammaton always comes in winter, and winter represents the difficult types of ordeals, the very hard ordeals that we have to pass through. Winter is precisely that moment in which the Tetragrammaton goes into Egypt because Herod wants to kill him, or when Moses is hidden within the river because the Pharaoh wants to kill him. These are the same symbols in different levels. Or oh, as Confucius says, the pines are those trees that are always green in winter. They show their strength in winter. Let me tell you about uh, <clears throat> Simon the Magician. In order for you to understand uh, about these uh, tests that we had to follow. And that sometimes we do not understand the doctrine of Christ. And how... These demoniacs can follow, according to their own whim, the forces that they think related with belief. In every epoch, in every era, there is always eons, masters, that acquire self-realization and that have missions to perform in order to help because the higher forces which are already developed in the masters, conscious forces, can help us. This is why an eon becomes an eon because we need the assistance of those masters internally. And the one that works through them is always the Tetragrammaton, Yod Chava, Chokmah, the Christ, as energy. So they divide the government of the world for the development of the soul in different epochs. They appear as avatars, messengers, prophets. They are the vehicles of Da'at. And in order to receive the help that the higher hierarchy is sending, to the planet, to the three-dimensional world, we have to handle it, to take it through them, because they are vehicles. It is like, for instance, we say, I need light. And then I said, okay, I take this, uh, I have this candle already lit, take it. And with this candle, you will have the fire. That is why what the white light says to the messenger. The messenger is then with the candle, but the other people say, well, 
I know how to make fire. And then the messenger says, okay, make it. But you need my candle to understand that fire. And they know, but how to, uh, I mean, how to make the fire. But the higher forces don't come through mechanicity or by our own whim, but through vehicles. And therefore, we have to respect those masters or those prophets in every epoch. Because you find them in every epoch because they work and give the knowledge. And that is why Master Jesus said in that epoch, no one comes to the Father but through me. Because at that time, he was, of course, the avatar. And he was having the light, the solar light of Chokhmah. So therefore, if we accept him as a prophet, as a Messiah, the light comes to us. But if we reject him, the light doesn't come to us, even if we know how to make fire, meaning if we know how to practice sexual alchemy. Because he was the vehicle of that light. So Simon the Magician says, I know how to transmute my sexual energy. I will self-realize myself because I know how. I don't have to follow Jesus because I know the way. So I hollow my own way. So this is precisely what happened with all of those that think that they can do their work just because they know it without respecting the hierarchy. The hierarchy gives the initiations. The hierarchy opens the doors in order to guide you because the hierarchy is a guidance, internal guidance that will open the initiations for you. And we have to pass through those initiations, tests. The hierarchies are the ones that test you. But if you push aside the messengers that they send, how are they going to test you? Then there will be anarchy. And the problem of Simon the Magician is that he was a great Gnostic in the beginning. But he pushed aside the hierarchy of masters. He pushed aside Master Jesus. And he said that he is self-realized. He has developed himself. He states, I will do it the same thing in my own way. And Jesus says, no one comes to his own inner father but through me. Because I am the avatar. I am the messenger. And because of pride, Simon the Magician continues his own way and developed down there in Klipoth because of pride. This is why we have to always be humble before the hierarchies and to respect the messengers because every time and in every epoch we have a different way, a different messengers, messengers in order to comprehend there is always an evolution, a development, and if we want to apply the wisdom of the path, we have to do it very wisely, in accordance with the avatar, with the messenger. And this is something very delicate, because, and that is in relation with the mind. The mind is precisely Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. And at the time of Elijah, Jezebel was fighting against Elijah. But he was the messenger. And if you read that story of Elijah in the first book of Kings, chapter 18, you will understand what I'm talking about. There's a lot of Kabbalah there and symbolism. But if you meditate on what you read, then you will understand and to acquire a lot of wisdom. That is precisely in relation with Simon the Magician. 
it is not enough to know how to do it. We have to know how to handle and respect the hierarchies, the forces, because otherwise there will be anarchism. Anarchy is represented in Hod. When you gather the forces by yourself, then you are a part of way, and the masters will respect your free will. You decide that, that's what you decide, they will say, well, it's okay, this is what he wants. But if you want their assistance, you have to come here and to respect and to be humble. There are many like Simon the Magician, and the problem is, of course, the intellect. That is their problem. It is not enough to know the doctrine. We have to also know how to follow it, and sometimes one is punished severely, even when you follow the path. Another person that existed uh, in this last century was that initiate that knew about transmutation, etc. But he was doing it in his own way. His name was uh, Rasputin. He didn't know, uh, I mean, he didn't achieve anything ultimately because he had powers in this physical plane, yes. He was having a lot of magnetism, a lot of power, but at the end he didn't do anything spiritually because he was practicing sexual magic with any woman that came in his way and that does not develop anything. Of course, he did not fornicate. He was transmuting always. As Simon the Magician, he knew how to transmute, but that does not awaken someone positively because there are two polarities. It is a scientific force that works with the two polarities. Even in this physical plane, if you want light, one positive wire and another negative wire, but if you put two negative wires with one positive wire together, you search, you uh, short circuit. If one wire is taken away, well, then you get another one. But understand, it can only be one woman, not two at the same time, or three or four. A Rasputin, who was transmuting with many women, he developed a lot of uh, clipotic power physically, but spiritually he was zero. He became just a bunch of devils with power. You see, this work is delicate, and that is why I said, within the ark were the Ten Commandments, which are ten rules for those that want to follow the path. And you have to know and to study the Ten Commandments. It has to be uh, legal for you to memorize the Ten Commandments. But you can, you can memorize the Ten Commandments. But if you do not understand them, then you transgress them. You have to know how to apply them, because these are the Ten Sephiroth that are just the beginning, because in reality we have two com uh, 22 commandments. But to begin, only 10. After that, we had to accomplish them, the 22. Then the hierarchy will show you the other 12 to understand them. About Adonai representing the superior forces in Malkut, in opposition to Baal, let me explain. <clears throat> the master of Nai is an Ian. It is a master that is related with the positive ray of the moon. That is why when we conjure Baal or Baal, we say, In the name of Gabriel, may Adonai command thee and drive thee hence Baal or Baal. Baal is a negative aspect of the moon. It's a lunar negative force, the opposite of Adonai. But in Hebrew, both words means 
Lord o Master o Mister. Adonai means Lord. And Baal means Mister o Sir. In Israel, uh, sometimes, in order to show you respect, they call you Baal. But this is just physically. Because Baal is the head of the house. But esoterically speaking, Baal is somebody that represents the negative forces of hell. While Adonai is the Lord. That represents the forces of heaven above. He represents the being, represents the tetragrammaton. While Baal is something related with the ego, with the protoplasmic bodies, with Jezebel. That is why Jezebel worshiped the Baalim, or Baal, which is uh, the which are the forces of below in Klipoth. But we had to learn how to worship the higher forces of Elijah. That means my God is Jah. Do not forget. That is what uh, Elijah represents. My God is Jah. Hallelujah. It's always there. About Melchizedek. We said that uh, he is the king of the earth. In other words, that being is a force, the life of this planet, that is the eon of this planet Earth. Without Melchizedek, this planet Earth will be a moon without life. And of course, Melchizedek has a physical body. Better said, his human soul has physical body. This is represented in the Bible when the Bible addresses Melchizedek when Abraham was in war against Sodom and Gomorrah. Melchizedek appears before him, but that Melchizedek was the son of the Ian of the earth, the genie meaning the son of the genie of the earth, which are one, because in the end, the self-realized master are one. As the master Jesus said, the son and the father are one. The one that sees the son is seeing the father, right? But in our case, we are the soul, and we have our father, who is Jah. But if we say, if you see the Son, you see the Father, and put her, put her as, an, as an example, that will be a joke. Because Jezebel is strong in us. And we did not self-realize Jah within yet. This is why the Israelites, who were not self-realized, said to Jesus, Abraham which means Chesed, El, is our father. Yet Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you will do the words of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have here from God. This did not Abraham. Ye or you do the deeds of your father. Then said uh, them to Jesus, We, we not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you will love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither come I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you 
not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abide not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. And that is the truth. We have to kill all the Baalim inside of us. In order for us, the son, the soul, to unite, to be one with Jah. And that is a self-realized master, an Ian. That is the goal of the universe, to become an Ian. And that is not easy, but it's not impossible. <coughs> a lot of initiates did it. Namely, Abraham, Moses, Mohammed, Buddha, Krishna, Quetzalcoatl, Zarathustra, Samaelon, Beor, etc. They all did it. Why cannot we do it? It all depends on telema, willpower. We have to start here. Remembering Ja. This is how we start. Because these are not the end of times yet. Maybe the planet will start finishing uh, this humanity little by little. Because the planet is submitted to higher loss. But another planet will come. Another planet will appear. In another one, in another one. Remember that we have 3,000 cycles of opportunities. And in each cycle, 108 human lives. So that is why Master Samael Onveor stated, it is difficult for a monad not to self-realize. There are a lot of opportunities in different scenarios, but there are some of them who do not do it. But those who do not self-realize are those monads that do not uh, feel any interest for all of these studies. And if they listen to this, they don't care. But uh, all of us listening to this, all of us that we are here and enjoying this because our monad wants the self-realization and that is why it is pushing us. It says, My poor people of Israel are suffering. Go and listen to the lecture. And then you are here, listen to this knowledge. But you are here with your 12 tribes in bondage. All the parts of your soul are submitted to the materialistic world, right? So all of us are waiting for Moses. Well, Moses is telema, willpower, is work. Let us finish this lecture by reading the Psalm 95, verse 7. In the Bible. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Tetragrammaton, our Maker, for He is our Elohim, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. Thank you very much.
The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most Gnostic schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every single donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing and available from booksellers worldwide. Visit GnosticBooks.org to learn more. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.